What's up, guys and gals of the movement world? It's Sean Mishka, the Movement Miyagi, coming to you once again on behalf of Football Beyond the Stats and our Mover of the Year feature for 2023 of Christian McCaffrey, running back of the San Francisco 49ers. And we go towards the end of the season in one of the Niners' biggest games on what would be Monday Night Football, Christmas Day against the Baltimore Ravens, a game that they would ultimately lose here in Week 15 a potential Super Bowl rematch uh, or Super Bowl preview rather uh, of what we might be able to expect to see if the number one seed from the AFC ends up meeting the number one seed from the NFC. Christian McCaffrey, one of the sole bright spots for the San Francisco 49ers, probably along with fellow all movement team member in George Kittle, uh, tight end of the San Francisco 49ers, who also had a big game. We see Christian McCaffrey showing off one of his greatest movement strengths, and that's his ability to perceive and intend and make decisions around 2v1 dyadic relationships in the open field and in space. What am I talking about? We're about to get into that right here, right now. So we see here later in the second quarter, winding down in the first half, Chris McCaffrey taking a zone uh, play here towards the left side of the offense. And we're going to see him work off of both Debo Samuel, fellow all movement team member uh, as well, as well as his fullback um, here in, in this interaction. So let's see it at a hundred percent speed. Then we're going to get into it at 50% speed as we always do. And then I'm going to try to give you guys a little insight as to what we might be able to learn when we watch Christian McCaffrey in 2v1 type of scenarios and situations, when a guy, the ball carrier, has an advantage, still a complex movement problem, but let's see what he does, how he flexes his movement skill muscle, and what we might be able to do in our learning environments to see this type of movement skill facilitated in the ball carriers that we might work with. So even though this play doesn't go for uh, a big play, it doesn't go for a touchdown. Oops, I went a little too far here uh, as we see him in an earlier play. But let's really, again, try to put ourselves into the perceptions, the cognitions, and the actions of his movement system as he solves this respective movement problem. Okay, I want you guys one more time at 100% speed before we get at our 50% speed and really kind of ruminate around what he might be perceiving, meaning what information he's connecting to and how that information might lead to the coupling of his movement actions. Okay, so again, we're going to get into 50% speed as we always do. Let's once again remember this is against one of the better teams in all of the National Football League, if not the best team in the National Football League team, um, who has one of the, if not the, most equipped and special moving defenses as a whole here also. We're going to see it at a, be able to see it at a couple different angles here as well. And though we could look towards how he's connecting to the movement problem here, this first local movement problem in this zone scheme for him to be able to hit this lane and hit this gap, this awfully um, wide emerging gap, as we can already see, even though it'll look slightly different to him from his perspective as we're about to find out. But we see a number of different affordances or opportunities to act that could be inviting or beckoning him, calling for him to act in a given way. But we also have to remember here that based on the tactics, based on the schematics, he is going to be perceiving and reading in the moment from a zone standpoint for him to be able to just kind of fall into that space. But he's also going to be connecting to 44 here, his fullback, and watching him as the lead into this space so he can work his actions off of this. And that's where he presses into uh, use check number 44 as long as he can before deciding 
in determining where it is that he needs to go. But as you're about to see when we see it from the other angle, it's pretty clear as to where he has to go because Juszczyk, number 44, one of the better fullbacks, if not the best fullback in the league, uh, is equipped at being able to hit some of these opponents and hit them head on to be able to leave McCaffrey to do what he does best, which is exactly what it is that we're about to find here as we see Debo Samuel getting into open field. When McCaffrey moves through this gap and through this space, let me take us to about right here, okay? This, again, is the calling card of the mover of the year, CMC, Christian McCaffrey, and we don't see a better example across the National Football League in these 2v1 type of scenarios with a ball in hand, whether we're talking about a running back, a wide receiver, a tight end, it doesn't matter. Christian McCaffrey is the exemplar of how to interact based on this unfolding problem that we're about to find or problems like it. Look at how much of an advantage he actually has here right now because of how long he has to be able to connect to this movement problem. Obviously, we talk a lot about informational variables that an individual might be connecting to, interpersonal distance being a big one. But we also look, as this problem is going to unfold, the amount of space to the left and to the right of this blocker defender dyadic relationship that exists and that is unfolding in front of McCaffrey between Debo and Debo Samuel. And I don't know who this defensive back is for the Ravens quite yet uh, from this perspective, but this dyadic relationship, this one V one blocker defender and Christian's connection, his perceptual connection to how this information is unfolding about this dyadic relationship. And we can kind of see how it unfolds. And this is a really cool illustrative example to show us who Christian McCaffrey is in these types of scenarios. We'll see a lot of backs make a decision too early or too late. And the reason why I pause here, we can see Christian kind of temper the storm a little bit, back off on the gas pedal a bit. You can see based on his movement mechanics right now, he's giving Debo a little bit of time to close his own space in this relationship, right? So Christian here now is able to take in a little bit more information, if I can, about this relationship. He's going to look to and then ultimately through to the defender to start seeing if this guy is going to start to fade just a little to the left or to the little of right, depending on exactly how Debo is interacting. Again, a live movement problem unfolding in an live and online fashion. Okay, hopefully it's making some sense, but I'm setting the tone in this way because this is exactly the same types of movement problems we can set for our backs in indie period, I think is a perfect place and time to do it when we get into a couple other periods between indie and team, we would see these types of scenarios, which are really easy to manipulate constraints around changing workspace width and workspace length, meaning the workspace size and or shape, the interactions, who this uh, offensive player, our own blocker might be. Maybe it's a wide receiver like a Debo Samuel. Maybe we get Kittle or our tight end out there in front in this lead blocking type of example in open space. Then again, we can use this defender in different ways also and it's really easy to manipulate constraints to where we might have either chasers or extra layers deeper. So we might have another deeper defender or a defender coming over the top from the middle of the field towards the, the actual number or the sideline, depending on where the offensive player goes. Or we could have a chaser from behind, as we might see here with the guy that's coming off a of Kittle. I'm just showing you guys this so you can understand what it means for your own learning environments. Because this skill, which is a very rare and nuanced one, 
has very specific specifying information for the ball carrier to attend to and to couple their movement behaviors to. Watch McCaffrey here in the relationship with Debo, okay? The reason why I'm going back is you should be able to see this unfold in this way as we look at it go frame by frame and McCaffrey just begins to follow and set up that defender accordingly. That's why I keep going back and forth, back and forth. I want you guys to see how closely coupled his movement behaviors are, one more time through, to this blocker defender interaction. Really cool stuff. Okay. And until he gets the defender committed to be blocked by Debo, he doesn't hit the gas pedal. He doesn't fully commit to that acceleration. We can see he's not moving at as high as speed here. He's drawing this defender in. Uh, no, I took my arrows away. He's drawing this defender into this space with the deceptive look or appearance, this misleading affordance that he's going to go to the sideline. So once he sees this cat here begin to commit, he knows that Debo is able to wall off that defender. And it's then that McCaffrey, watch him now in the next beat to two beats. Okay. So like, think about it like that, just a boom, boom. And he's in the gas pedal as he draws this guy in right there. And we see him hit the gas pedal accordingly. Now, in these types of scenarios and situations, particularly when he has a guy or with chasers, I'll talk a little bit about this in other videos and in his weaknesses, okay? When he knows where he's going, he sometimes will miss opportunities to act. He misses the information because he gets in this track tunnel vision mode it can be a positive and it can be a benefit in some scenarios and situations such as when he's able to fully get in his gas pedal and start running through the gears here a bit but when the problem is changing and we might have a defender who has a bit of an angle on him as we see here we do sometimes see him miss the opportunity to act or just even detect and perceive information about that guy until it's too late. We see him look at Williams there pretty late in it. But he's so committed to hitting that gas pedal that he feels as though this green space right down the sideline is calling for him. Okay, He feels as though he can beat number 32 Williams to the sideline, but based on where he is, he cannot. Now, who knows if there would have been another opportunity to act had he connected to Williams earlier. But at the very least, what he can do is begin to either coordinate, control, and organize a more novel movement solution to potentially look to have a power strategy or solution to get a few more yards or potentially in certain scenarios and situations, look to cut it back to the inside. That's not going to be the case here, right? But we see him connect to Williams very late. And once that gap has closed considerably, again, there really isn't too much more of an opportunity to act here in this particular scenario or situation, but we do see this from CMC occasionally. And he does pick up a few more yards here, but we don't know what else could have unfolded had he perceived Williams just a little earlier. And then he gets brought down by Marlon Humphrey before he gets to the end zone. It's going to take us to the next view. So we're going to be able to see it from the end zone or uh, it's kind of this floating viewpoint, which will allow us to see some things here with number 44 or four, uh, Kyle Juszczyk, um, and then, of course, Trent Williams, one of the best in the game. Debo Samuel, one of the best in the game at, at all things. Uh, my versatile weapon, uh, offensive weapon of the year. And then we got some big-time defenders back here. Um, Roquan Smith and Patrick Queen, uh, along with this very stacked 
uh, defensive unit of the Ravens. So let's just watch it unfold here. And you can see, I don't know if this is Troy Aikman or who this is, but somebody drawing on this, I'm guessing it's probably Aikman. And we're going to see exactly what it is that I was referring to as far as this zone scheme and Kyle Shanahan up in his bag, giving Christian McCaffrey a lot of space to work and operate with. This zone scheme doesn't turn so zone any, zone any longer, and it's a gaping hole that, uh, you know, McCaffrey knows exactly where he needs to go and when he needs to go there, and he needs to go there now, right? But it all is because of this relationship right here. And again, one of the best blocking units in all of football in the San Francisco 49ers, okay? But we watch this again as he works through this. And you can see already kind of what his perspective might be. We're going to tell the movement problem-solving story from CMC's perspective. Look at this unfolding dyadic relationship here once again. And you can begin to think about how the what is, the how the problem is unfolding in front of him is leading to, it's channeling his perceptions, his cognitions, his intentions, and his decisions. And ultimately, the adaptability of his actions in the movement strategies that he employs. We see it again from this perspective really nicely. And when he finds the opportunity to hit that gas pedal, but he's doing it based on how he's relating to this dyadic relationship. Again, the best in the game, the exemplar of this. And we're probably talking about a handful of ball carriers in the history of the National Football League who did it at this level in these 2v1 interactions with a blocker and a defender than Chris McCaffrey. We're probably talking about the Barrys, the Marshalls, the Ladanian Tomlinsons of the world in these 2v1 scenarios and situations where they're solving the movement problem that is in front of them in this moment by moment, constantly unfolding fashion with these problem and solution dynamics in this way. Now, how would we set up a movement problem in our own learning environments that look, feel, act, and behave like this? I'd start right here, okay? I wouldn't even use the whole unit, okay? Yes, that is the most representative way of going about it. But I would start it, um, the movement problem that is, probably a beat or two, uh, a frame or two, right before this, right where he's coming through the hole, okay? And what we would typically do, at least in our learning environment, let me get some stars out here if I could. Uh, so bear with me. Let me get some stamps here to work with. Okay. Um, I got a stamp up here at the first down marker, probably one, uh, at the hash. And then, you know, for good measure, we're going to just call it somewhere here. Right. And this would be a little further back, probably at the 35. You guys can kind of see where I'm going with this. Okay. Usually we would be thinking about this tunnel, changing it up rep to rep in a repetition without repetition fashion, where we might be working from hash to sideline and then about 10, 12, or 15 yards long, okay? So we got this wide space, this long tunnel that we're going to operate in. In rep to rep, we would be changing that up. We might do it one rep this way, okay, at the hashes, at the sidelines, and then we go to the sideline again, okay? And we're just going to call it at 11, 12 yards here. And then at the numbers. So if we're going to put it one right there, we're going to put a cone here, we're going to put a cone here. So this tunnel gets a lot narrower. And then that changes the workspace. And as we change the workspace, it changes the entire dynamics, okay? We would typically change that up um, at least set to set, if not rep to rep. Okay. Um, now, again, I already began to mention we have this one, two. So we have two V1 with this defender. 
We're going to do a lot of reps, give them a lot of exposure in this way. It's just what we're doing is going to change up these parties as much as we possibly can. Who is the blocker and who is the defender? That changes the nuances of the movement toolbox of each one of those parties, which then will change the movement problem that this player here in CMC has to solve. Okay, so they're going to get a lot of goes, get a ton of exposure to this constantly unfolding problem. And then what we would attempt to do with a guy like CMC would be to educate his attention, meaning what information he's connecting to. We would nudge him to look for information about this unfolding interaction to look to his blocker, but also through to the defender nudging him, encouraging him to search and explore for said information. We would likely also ask him to change his intention, asking him how might you be able to act deceptively so it opens up more space for you to operate in. What we would likely to see emerge would be that movement behavior being awfully connected to this dyadic relationship right here, okay? Not just the guy moving for movement's sake and not just the guy going and hitting the gas pedal to hit either one of these spaces too early to where this defender is not going to be able to um, be picked up by the blocker and they're gonna be able to corral or at least contain the ball carrier. That's what we would see in the lesser skilled performer. They would likely not, uh, I guess, move in a way that we see from McCaffrey where he gets close enough to Debo that it affords this huge gaping space right here to work with, okay? And we're not gonna tell them exactly how to act. But what we are going to do is encourage them to solve this alive movement problem in their own authentic and adaptable way. But when they have attunement, attunement that has been developed through a lot of goes, there, this type of movement behavior, guys and gals, you'd be surprised at how quickly it begins to emerge in a very similar way to what we see from Christian McCaffrey right here. Now, they might not have Christian McCaffrey's action capabilities. They're likely not to have Christian McCaffrey's attunement or overall adaptability. But what they do begin to get is enough of these yards that are connected to this movement problem in this very, eh, let's just, I don't want to use the word specific because there are no new, no two movement problems are ever the same. Neither are any two solutions. You guys have heard me say it before. But there's a way for us to facilitate that if and when we give these types of players this type of exposure. Hopefully some of that makes some sense for you guys. Obviously, if you have questions, you have thoughts, dive into the other videos here for our movement, uh, our mover of the year 2023 feature on CMC. But this 2v1, him and a teammate versus an opponent in space on the numbers or near the sideline on either side. You're gonna see it from CMC very frequently, whether it's right here this year, 2023 National Football League season, or whether it's previous seasons, both at the 49ers last year, as well as at the Panthers. You might even see it if you dive deep enough into some Stanford Cardinal uh, highlights as well. So for Sean Mishka, the Movement Miyagi, this has been our Mover of the Year feature on CMC, Christian McCaffrey of the San Francisco 49ers. I'll talk to you guys in the rest of the videos.